Well, that was sure fun. Thank you, Jeannie. And Senator Shaheen, you made us sound so old, almost as old as Earth Day. <laughs> what a pleasure to have you with us tonight, and so we could honor you for all the leadership you have shown. You have broken so many glass ceilings. You even made the glass, the glass ceilings energy efficient. <laughs> but seriously, Jeannie has been a remarkable leader in a state that is a hard state to lead, as we all know from watching presidential politics every four years. And when I met Jeannie in 1983, we were so fortunate to have strong women in a presidential campaign, first year ever to have a presidential press secretary, I must say it was pretty amazing, and to have the chairman of the campaign, uh, a strong woman who went on to be governor, went on to be senator, and went on to be such a champion for the issues that matter. When we talk about the UN, when we talk about funding for reproductive health and rights, when we talk about maternal health, when we talk about making sure girls have the right to a, a, a future, Jeannie Shaheen is the leader of those questions, those issues, and those priorities. Thank you, Jeannie. And she's a super, super advocate, and we appreciate that. And it's why we were able to recognize you last year with our Global Health and Rights Hero Award. And so thank you again for all you've done for the global fight for women. And I want to thank Kathleen Rogers and Dennis Hayes and the whole Earth Day Network for this award. You have created not a day, but a movement that has moved all of us to think differently about the world we live in, the way we interact with it, as you so brightly said, Ovi, thank you for that and that we could all, like Leanne, the Banneker girls, and everybody in this room become champions every single day. So thank you for giving us the power, Dennis. You've been wonderful. <laughs> and it's also fun to be recognized on the same evening as the incredible Nancy Fund, who started another movement, the Double Bottom Line movement. Nancy, congratulations. So happy to be here with you tonight. So it is because of our whole team at the UN Foundation that I'm here tonight, but it's also because of one man, Ted Turner, who had the vision and audacity and, and chutzpah to stand up 20 years ago this year and say he wanted to put his money where his mouth was and support the United Nations. It wasn't cool back then to support the United Nations, just as it wasn't cool to care about the climate or the environment, but Ted knew what was important and he made a difference by creating the UN Foundation. And he made energy and environment two of the fundamental pillars of what we worked on from those very earliest days with the support of then Secretary General Kofi Annan. So he charged us to help bring people and groups to the UN to support work on climate action and renewable and clean energy. And to drive our work, he recruited no other than Ted Tim Worth, who you all know and have seen at this dinner many, many times, to lead the organization. So I want to especially thank Tim, who's in Boston tonight with his daughter, who's leading a movement of mothers on climate. I want to thank both Tim and Ted for their foresight, their leadership, their perseverance, and their courage. Can I have you thank them with me? And I say courage because from the very beginning of the foundation's work, we also stood for the notion that to protect the planet, we needed to protect women's rights. So tonight I wanna to talk about how those two issues, those two priorities must and can be connected for we cannot have environmentalism without feminism. So it may not be popular to say this in a room full of environmentalists, but the driving issue in my life, as Jeannie said, has been the rights of girls and women. But because of my commitment to gender equality, I have become a fierce advocate for climate action. So it starts with the fact that women and girls are particularly vulnerable to climate change and environmental degradation. 
As the mother of sustainable development, Gru Harlem Brundtland, who is the vice chair of our board, says, climate change is not gender neutral. But my message tonight is not that women are victims. It's rather the opposite. Girls and women are, the, are on the front lines of climate change impacts, but they are also on the front lines of climate change solutions. In fact, according to a recent analysis, modern contraception and girls' education are two of the top 10 solutions to climate change. And as President John Kennedy said, our problems are man-made, therefore they may be solved by man. Well, I would say in this day and age, in the case of climate change, solved by women. So I talk a lot about girl power, and I do because it's one of global development's most potent weapons in the fight against poverty. When a girl is healthy, educated, and empowered, she has fewer and healthier children, she earns more money for her family, and her children are better educated. The ripple effects are enormous, especially for climate change. In the UN Foundation's work on energy access, clean cooking, and climate, we see firsthand how women are leading on the front lines of on the green economy. The entrepreneur who's selling clean cook stoves, the nurse delivering a baby with solar power, and the adolescent girl who's engineering solutions for the next generation of clean energy in her own community. And elevating women's voices in decision making contributes to better land use, stronger disaster risk management, and improved outcomes of climate related projects. So there's no question that women are leading the way to a new era of sustainable development. But here's my second point. We all need to step up our efforts to support them. For too long and too often, we have been working in silos, development, environment, women's rights, and we miss the big picture. The environment, development, and human rights agendas are all connected and lasting progress on any of them requires progress on all of them. So tonight, I want to talk about why we have to have a shared blueprint, and we luckily have one. It's the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement that were adopted just three year years ago at the United Nations. They laid out a plan to address how we get to connecting all of these issues of social, economic, and environmental challenges. We need to work at the nexus of how they all come together, and we need to find common ground, find new ways to partner, and think bigger. That's the easy part. The hard part is simply understanding how everything is linked. So I just want to say tonight to you, if you care about saving the planet, you probably also care that 314 million girls and women have an unmet need for reproductive health and modern contraception. If you care about conservation, then you probably care about the 131 million girls who can't go to school. And if you care about gender equality, you also care about stopping pollution. And if you care about maternal health, you obviously also care that thousands of clinics don't have reliable power. Collaboration among all of us is critical. And right now, all of these agendas are facing even more serious political threats. Tim Worth and John Podesta recently wrote, this is all the more reason for us all to find common ground and fighting the health for healthy women and a healthy planet. So I want to challenge us all to take the next two years as we work up to Earth Day 2020 to agree that we will reach across the aisle, we will reach across the agendas, and we will find those opportunities to reinforce each other's causes because they will all make us stronger. Ted Turner once said, you just can't walk away from problems. We just have to take hands and face them together. That's what we try to do every day at the foundation, and I urge that we try to do it together. And because this is the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of which that's really what we're all talking about, I'm going to close with a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my heroes. Surely in the light of history, it is more intelligent to hope than to fear, to try rather than not to try. For one thing we know beyond all doubt, nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can't be done. We know it can be. 
We're on to 2020, and thank you so much again for this award.